The Oracle Network. Ted Bundy murdered my dad's friend in 1974 while on his reign of terror in Utah. At least, Bundy admitted to killing her just before his execution, but police were never able to locate her body. That's the topic of just one episode on Straight Up Enigmas, a podcast to explore the unexplained, spine-tingling supernatural stories, historical mysteries, and true crime cases are all things to expect when you tune in to our show. We discuss the impossible murder of Julia Wallace, share terrifying true stories from our listeners about sleep paralysis, and explore Cleopatra's lost tomb. I'm Jaden McKell, and I'm the host of Straight Up Enigmas. Our bite-sized bi-weekly episodes focus on the world's strangest mysteries, Sacred and Sonic Geometry, The Mistress of Murder Farm, Turkmenistan's Door to Hell, The Curse of the Horror Film The Omen, and much more. Listen and subscribe at Apple Podcasts or wherever you find podcasts. Hey, 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 Rainbow Warriors. This is my disclaimer. Beyond the Rainbow is a true crime podcast. It's not suitable for young children, and maybe not even for some adults. I tend to swear like a sailor, and I'm kind of proud of that. Listener discretion is advised. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. Welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBT. I'm your host, Ellen DeGeneres. Can you imagine how awesome that'd be if I were? Although her life's a little bit scandalous right now. With all the allegations of sexual harassment in the back scenes of her show. Not her, but her people that she hired. Anywho, I'm going to do a little something different this episode. Instead of the normal missing but not forgotten segment, I'm going to give you some updates about some past cases I've covered. Okay, Rainbow Warriors. Time to search your memory bank. The episode I covered on gay hate. There was an attack I told you about. Four guys attacked two gay guys in front of a bathroom in Florida during Pride. The gay guys were Renee and Dimitri, and they were just holding hands outside a public bathroom on a beach. The four young men started to yell gay slurs, and then they started to punch Renee and Dimitri. And when it was all said and done, the four guys ended up turning themselves in because it was plastered all over the media. So the four guys turned themselves in, but then their trials were all put off due to COVID. It's been three years now since that attack. There was also one other thing that kind of um, delayed the whole trial thing, and that was all four of the guys were represented by the same attorney. And since then, they all got themselves separate attorneys. So that slowed down the process also. Well, as it turns out, one of the four attackers is also a gay man. It's been confirmed, and he's openly gay and has been. And the other three friends, (laughs) well, they're all volunteers at various LGBTQ organizations, and they previously have been honored for their work with an Equality for All type program. So, as you can see, this puts a serious wrench into the hate crime allegation and that homophobic slurs were yelled at Renee and Dimitri. I'm pretty sure that the hate crime charge is going to be dropped, but they'll probably go ahead with the assault charge. And it appears to me that the whole court system around America is back in operation, so we might eventually know what the outcome of this trial is. In my very first case ever of Holly Harvey and her girlfriend Sandy Ketchum, the two young girls that planned and carried out the murder of Holly's grandparents, Holly was sentenced to two life sentences. And her girlfriend, Sandy Ketchum, was sentenced to three life sentences. And Sandy somehow was up for parole last year. I don't really understand how that works. Holly had two life sentences. Sandy had three, yet Sandy's up for parole sooner. I don't get that. But anyway, Sandy was up for parole last year. And as far as I can tell, 
Sandy still sits in the Pulaski State Prison, and she's seeking pen pals. Holly definitely remains in prison, and she's not scheduled for a probation hearing until 2025. In another earlier episode, the year 2002 saw a transgender teenager, Gwen Arahu, murdered by four men one night in California. And then those men drove her body all the way up north, almost to Nevada, and they disposed of her on a road off Highway 50. Then the men turned around and headed back towards their home. But first they stopped for a bite to eat at McDonald's. Two of the men had confessed to voluntary manslaughter, and they only received 11 years. They've been out on parole for a few years now. The other two men, Jose Morel and Michael McGidson, they were sentenced to 15 years to life. Jose Morel was released on probation in 2016. Jose said he didn't understand the depths of his actions until his own daughter passed away in 2011. Also in 2016, Michael McGidson, he went up before the parole board. He still had no remorse at all for killing Gwen. He told the board he wasn't ready for release yet. He was up for parole three years later in 2019, but he was denied. He might likely be up for parole every three years, but until he's ready to show some humanity and some remorse for what he did to Gwen, I think he's going to remain in prison where he deserves to be until he dies. Gwen's murder became a catalyst for banning transphobic defense in California. In my final update, Back in April of last year, I did an episode on Allie Lee Steinfeld, who was a young trans male to female. Allie was also very gender fluid. She was murdered by her girlfriend at the time and the girlfriend's roommates. At the time I told you about the case, one roommate, the most instrumental in Allie's murder, still had not gone to trial yet. Andrew Verba was the guy who actually physically killed Allie while the other suspects were the ones that contributed to disposing of Allie's body and hiding of evidence. But those other suspects already had their day in court. Andrew Verba's trial finally came to a close last November. He was sentenced to life in prison without the eligibility of parole. And that's it for all the updates. Periodically, I'll check on cases and status updates of our missing but not forgotten, so that way I can report back to you, warriors. Find me on the socials, Facebook at Beyond the Rainbow Pod. Join my Facebook group by the same name. I'm on Instagram at Beyond the Rainbow Pod or Rainbow Crimes 12. You can send questions for me to answer on my webpage or suggest a case by emailing me through my website at beyondtherainbowpodcast.com. I have a huge shout out to Rainbow Warrior Amanda. She sent me this totally awesome unicorn self-defense tool, and I love it. It's rainbow-colored. I'd also like to thank four other rainbow warriors, warriors that I know purchase shirts on my Rainbow Crimes Tea Public site, and that's Jonathan in New Zealand, Lorena and Allison in California, and my buddy Jamie. Jamie also bought me a coffee at my buy me a coffee link, which is in the show notes. I so appreciate it. Every little bit earned helps me work towards my goal of being able to send Rainbow Warriors trinkets as a way to say thank you and towards being able to get some new equipment soon. So the title of this episode is Little Dick. Maybe you think I'm going to share erotic tales of lust with you. Yeah, no. But the story is about a small dick. Kind of. I've always heard from my straight female friends, when it comes to having sex with a man, size doesn't matter. It's what he does with it that counts. According to David Clark, this sentiment apparently didn't hold true for his wife, Melanie. David didn't like that his wife told him that his penis was small. So he killed her. At least that's what he told the news media. Melanie was a South African born and raised woman who had been previously married From that prior marriage, she had four children, two boys and two girls. By the time she was in her early 30s, things had went south with that husband, so they parted ways. David Clark had met Melanie in South Africa. 
He fell for her, and he married her when he was in his late 30s. David also had grown up in South Africa. The couple had been together for about 10 years. He was a real estate agent, or what is called an estate agent in the UK. He and Melanie moved to the UK with the children in 2011. They lived in the Cloverdale Bromsgrove neighborhood of Worcestershire. Melanie got a job at a care facility. Friends there say she was a ton of fun. She was bubbly and super energetic. They really liked her a lot. As for her current marriage with David, it was turbulent. Things were touch and go, hot and cold, up and down, yin and yang, salt and pepper, sunny and share. I could go on with these comparisons forever, but I think you get the point. It wasn't a very stable marriage. David is said to have been a very controlling individual. His control was to the point most would say was abusive. Much of it was coercive control and threats, which is an act played out by many narcissistic people. His controlling behavior was not only directed at Melanie, but also at her four children. By 2015, the relationship with David's stepdaughter, Melanie's youngest, was so strained The girl ended up moving back to South Africa to be with her real father. When the eldest daughter was of age, she too moved out, leaving only the two boys at the home. The boys were now in their late teens, and they were nearing adulthood. Between friends and school, they were only at the house intermittently, mostly to just sleep. During the years of 2015 and 2017, David would move out, and then back into the house several times. David put himself on dating websites so he could engage in casual sex with women. It would seem Melanie and David had a contract of sorts that they could both have sexual relations outside of their marriage, making it an open relationship. The couple had separate bedrooms, and I know a lot of couples who have even the greatest of relationships, and they have separate rooms. So I wasn't shocked to read this, although I believe their separate room arrangement was more than likely because of their rocky relationship. What I did find odd was that David liked to keep some kitchen utensils in his room, including large paring knives. The day after Christmas in 2017, David's best friend, Stephen Bastian, and his daughter, Katie, who was 31 at the time, came over to David and Melanie's place for an overnight visit. Katie's a very pretty blonde woman and a reputable journalist in Australia. Katie is also a lesbian, who at the time was in a long-term relationship with plans to marry her girlfriend in Australia. Melanie and Katie had a girl's day. They spent the day shopping and they went to the gym. They joined the men later in the evening back at the house where they all had dinner and drinks. Around midnight, David went to his room. Stephen was going to sleep on the couple's couch, and the two women headed for the master bedroom, Melanie's room. From his room, David could hear the two women giggling and talking, and then he fell asleep. The next morning, David woke up and he took his buddies Stephen and Katie to the train station. Upon David's arrival back home, Melanie was sitting at the table drinking coffee, and she said to David, So, I want to tell you something. But don't get mad. Um, Katie started kissing me and she kind of moved down to the sweet spot. Melanie continued to describe in great detail to David what Katie had done to her. And even though David had had other sexual encounters outside of their marriage, David said to Melanie, You could have told her to stop. You could have told her no or turned away. Melanie didn't say a word. She just sipped her coffee, looking off into space, while a small smile danced across her lips. It would seem Melanie had kissed a girl, and she liked it a lot. New Year's Eve is supposed to be the time to celebrate the new beginning of the upcoming year. Kiss your sweetie at midnight. Say goodbye to the woes of the previous year. 
It was now New Year's Eve 2017. David and Melanie went over to their friend's home where they partook in a drinking game. They indulged in shots of whiskey, and the two couples killed three bottles of Prosecco. David and Melanie were in a great mood as they headed back home via taxi. This was around 10.30 p.m. Already very intoxicated, the couple had a few more drinks, and it wasn't long before a bitter argument started between David and Melanie. Melanie stormed off to her room yelling, It's not my fault your dick is so small and you don't know what to do with it. And she slammed her door. The couple kept fighting, but it wasn't verbally. It was via shitty texts back and forth to each other. By 11 p.m., David had texted his best friend Stephen that Stephen's daughter Katie and his wife Melanie had had a sexual encounter. And then David went and took a screenshot of what he sent to Stephen. Then a very proud of himself David sent the text back to Melanie. What a fucking man child. But needing to fuel the fire, Melanie texted David back. And Katie really is a delightful sight in her sexy lingerie. Ten minutes later, Melanie sent David another text telling him he and his shit needed to be out of the house the next morning by 10 a.m. David attempted to respond back to Melanie by sending Stephen the text again. Then he sent the screenshot to his own sister and then to Melanie's eldest son. By then, it was almost midnight. David texted to Melanie what he had done. Melanie sent back, They're laughing at you, David. They have been for the last 10 years. I want you out of the house by morning. Within the next two or three minutes, Melanie refused to respond to any more of David's texts. In a rage, David grabbed one of the long kitchen knives that was in his room, and he charged for the master bedroom. He threw open the door, and with great force, David plunged the knife into Melanie's chest. Melanie never saw it coming. She had no defensive wounds because she didn't have time to put up a fight. She might have even drifted off to sleep without a care in the world. Within the first few minutes of 2018, Melanie was dead. Once David had realized what he had done, he picked up the phone and he called 999, the UK's emergency services. I killed my wife. She fucking did my head in. When the officers arrived, they found David on the side of the house outside. David begged the officers to shoot him. About 10 minutes after the police arrived, Melanie's two sons, ages 19 and 22, arrived at the house. The boys were scurried away, and they went to stay with the couple whose home David and Melanie were at earlier in the night. David was wearing blood-soaked pajamas as the police led him away from his house on his 49th birthday. David's birthday is January 1st. At trial... David tried to tell everyone he had no recollection of the night. His defense was that he was an abused and battered husband. He said his wife ridiculed, humiliated, and emasculated him. And it caused him to snap. She said nobody liked me. She she said I should just do everyone a favor and, and kill myself. He also said he didn't remember telling the 999 operator he killed his wife. I didn't murder her. She pushed me to being mad. She always made jokes about the size of my penis, said I was no good in bed, threw that woman that she cheated on me with in my face. At the end of the trial, the jury of four women and seven men found David guilty of killing his wife. The judge sentenced him to a minimum of 15 years, minus the 191 days he already had served. After that, the judge said, It would be up to a parole board to decide if David should be freed. David made a lot of allegations against Melanie that couldn't be confirmed or denied by Melanie because he killed her. Media began to jump on the David bandwagon. They put out headlines like, Wife murdered because of her sordid lesbian affair. 
Wife picks on man's penis, so he kills her. David sounds like a spoiled brat. And if he doesn't get his way, he pitches a fit until he does get his way. Melanie sounded like someone who was so sick of her husband's shit, she turned to the gentle touch of a woman one night for comfort. David felt rejected, and if he couldn't have his wife, no one could. He was losing control, but he didn't have to worry about Katie. Yes, she was beautiful. Yes, she enjoyed his wife on many levels. But she was now back in Australia with her girlfriend. I believe David's insecurities, his low self-esteem about himself, are ultimately what prompted his brain to burst into fury. At the trial, David's best friend Stephen was asked if David ever spoke to him about his penis before. Stephen said he believed that David once had mentioned that he had a long one. So were the tiny penis comments that David said Melanie made to him on a constant just fabricated? Was it something to make people feel sorry for him? Make it sound like he was the one that was being abused and that was just part of his trial defense? That's very much a possibility. It truly seems that David's dick size mattered more to him than anyone else. A big thank you to my friends and fellow podcasters, Nicole from True Crime South Africa and NJ from another South African podcast called A Crime Most Queer. Both of these podcasts are excellent. True Crime South Africa is a deep dive look into some of the most heinous crimes in South Africa, while A Crime Most Queer looks at LGBTQ crimes in South Africa. Thanks again, Nicole and NJ. Rainbow Warriors, make sure to check out both those podcasts. Just a quick side note, in my show notes, I'm going to post where you can find international help for domestic abuse. I love you, Rainbow Warriors. And remember, it's not a crime to be gay, unless you're a murderer. <laughs>